how you evacuate. Do not return until an official all clear message is given by civil defence. The National Crisis Management Centre has been activated, as the Minister has said, in the Beehive in Wellington. All civil defence emergency management groups are active and closely monitoring the situation across the regions in support of their communities. Tsunami sirens in some areas have been used to advise of the warning. Regarding the emergency mobile alert, a series of EMAs, emergency mobile alerts, were issued to areas under land threat this morning, asking people to evacuate out of all tsunami zones to high ground or inland. The first alert was sent to the initial areas under the land threat on the east coast of the North Island. The warning was then extended to include the top of the west coast of the North Island. Only those in areas under land threat were sent the emergency mobile alert message. Thank you. That concludes my update. Minister. We're happy to take any questions. Minister, can you let us know if there was any uh, warning that these cracks would be coming? Look, the advice that we received is that the information came in from this morning. But I might turn to Bill Fry, who is uh, from GNS, who has been monitoring uh, the uh, indices for us. No, no, there's no way we can predict when the earthquakes happen. So the, the first of this morning came um, without any significant warning. Then after that, when we see a big earthquake like this, we know that we're more likely to see another earthquake after that. So we're particularly vigilant after the first earthquake, looking for the um, follow-on earthquakes. Can you explain how the three are connected and, and why they're doing it? And also maybe a comment on how unusual it is to see earthquakes mm -hmm. of this size. Yeah. So I, I can comment on how the um, first and the last are related because we have a, a pretty good feel for the physics and the science around that. The second middle earthquake, it's a, it's a bit more tenuous. So it happened quite far away, I think a thousand kilometers away from the first earthquake. When we, when we have a big earthquake like the first one at, at two o'clock this morning, we know in the region of the, that's very proximal to that earthquake, the nearby region, we know it's highly likely to have another earthquake. Usually that's not bigger than the first, which is what we've seen today, but it does happen. It's not unexpected. Um, and then when you get farther and farther away, you have to invoke other mechanisms that are a little less certain, um, certainly in the, the early hours of a response. How long have you been doing this and, and how unusual is this in your experience? I've been in, in in New Zealand um, for 13 years responding to large earthquakes and tsunamis and this is the first time we've had this particular um, sequence but every sequence we get um, it's usually complicated and we usually learn from it and that's what I expect we'll do today. Um, could you please clarify um, what the message is for Aucklanders who are near beaches? Yeah. Look, so the messaging is, uh, the, all of the messaging is available on the Civil Defence website. There has not been any uh, notification that they need to evacuate, only in those areas where they have been required to do so. That's correct. Auckland is not uh, within the uh, regions that are being asked to evacuate. Uh, Auckland is, uh, does have a beach and marine threat, as the Minister says, and uh, they need to stay off the beach uh, and out of the water. Did the warning systems work overnight? There didn't seem to be um, tsunami sirens or that kind of thing. Yeah, look, so the information that we've received this morning is that the system has held up, but as you'll be aware, with any event, we always undertake reviews and we're constantly reviewing throughout the course as we're going as well. Uh, the, the, um, the warning system that went out this morning, because we had that first lot at 2.30, it was very targeted to those areas where there may be a risk to life. So it was to quite smaller groupings. Uh, that, obviously, over the course of the day has been expanded as we got to that third earthquake. Uh, the advice that we've received is that the warning system is adequate, but I also too want to make the note that there have all of uh, the media have played a significant role today in informing and keeping people very abreast of what it is that they should be doing, and I need to acknowledge the important role you've all played. It, the, the NEMA system doesn't operate in isolation. It requires people to carry that information of which uh, this team here has been ex exceptional stewards of. So where we look to uh, in terms of the real impacts on the ground, do people know what they're meant to be doing? By and large, the responses and the feedback that we're getting is yes. Uh, when we're looking to those areas that needed to evacuate by and large, when we're on the phones and talking to those, it seems to be that people understand very clearly what they need to do. So if we look at it as a system whole, 
uh, has today's uh, exemplified that the system is working. It seems to be that's the case, but obviously we'll be doing ongoing reviews to ensure that that is the case. Do any of those sirens have gone off and didn't? Uh, perhaps I could make a comment on, on that, Minister. So the, the sirens are not um, um, operated nor, nor activated by national authorities. Where sirens exist, uh, they uh, belong to and, and are operated by uh, either local civil defence emergency management groups or, or possibly uh, uh, councils. Um, and uh, so that is um, uh, something for us to look at afterwards. Um, but um, the operation of the sirens is not uh, uh, is, is handled by NEMA. Do you have an idea of, or prediction about how extreme it could get, what sort of waves we might see? Yeah, look, we'll turn to Bill in a second for that. And the, the, the indicia that have come out in terms of the mapping that's been provided, in those lower-lying areas, uh, the, the predictions based on the science that they've provided is that under one metre that will get to that swell. But for the areas that we've been asked to evacuate, that's where we've got a, a, a window, if you will, uh, of a surge that may be between one metre to three metres, which is why we've asked for that evacuation. But, Bill, you might like to add something. Yeah. Sure. We, we know from previous experience around the globe that time saves lives. So the quicker we can issue advice, the better prepared we are to make sure that people stay safe. So what we do in a response like this is we use the, the earliest available data to issue a forecast. And that forecast necessarily has a large range of uncertainty. And that's where that one to three meters comes in. As time progresses, as we're, we're right now, as we speak, we're collecting more and more data. We're updating our forecasts. And then the uncertainty of that model gets smaller. So, so as you just heard, um, right now the land threat is between a one and, and three meter threshold. Um, we're not expecting them, but it's certainly possible. So as I said, when you get a big earthquake, you're more likely to have another big earthquake, but it's the unlikely scenario to, to have something bigger than the eight one we've just seen. People who have evacuated and are waiting up on higher ground, you've asked them to stay there until we know it's ready to go. Do you have any idea around the time frame that they could be waiting? And, and what are we looking for in terms of, you know, knowing that, that we've got the all clear to go? Yeah. To answer that uh, first, no, we don't have particular time frames. They could be quite long, could be quite lengthy, which is why we're asking people to really heavily rely on the broadcasting from media, from on the, the, the messaging from civil defence. Uh, Bill and his team are working exceptionally hard to ensure that the science is robust, that we have mitigated uh, the risk to life before we can enable people to go home. Uh, and so it may even be as lengthy as sometime this afternoon. Bill, you may want to add something further there. Sure. As we do improve the models, you might expect some of those threat bands, the coastal threat bands, to change. So rather than being a point in time where we say all of New Zealand's coastlines are completely safe, return to your normal activities, you might mm. see an alteration of that map where you see the, um, the areas that have the highest threat perhaps um, change levels um, and the other, the other threat bands change levels as well. Could you please run through what happened sort of at 2.30 in the morning and sort of what the response was and what was activated and, and sort of go through what happened? Yeah, absolutely. Look, uh, we're in the hands of Roger Ball at that point. Sure. So, um, 2.30 in the morning. Um, w I think one of the things to point out about that very first earthquake is that uh, a lot of people felt it all around New Zealand. And that's normal. That's what we expect. And that's what we base our public education campaign on, which is the first warning is often what we call natural, the felt effect. OK, so I got woken up. Uh, our duty team gets woken up. There is already a 24-7 awake um, uh, capability, which is based on the uh, Ge Geohazards Monitoring Centre, operated by GNS, and they are on it straight away. Our duty team assembles, uh, and we activate our National Crisis Management Centre here below the Beehive. So it's a, uh, a, a constant uh, flow of um, trying to assess data mm. and get public information out. And as the minister indicated earlier on, it's a constant tension between speed uh, and accuracy uh, because we want to get information out in a timely manner but we also want to make sure that what we're saying is useful and doesn't uh, lead to a yo-yo effect or, or having to uh, unwind the information. No, there's no people on the curb decks right now, from what we understand. But do we have any idea of how bad damage is to any kind of infrastructure that we do have there at this point? 
Yeah, we haven't received any information to date that I'm aware of of, in, of a damage assessment on the islands. Uh, at, over the course, though, of the next period, once uh, the emergency uh, and any kind of emergent risks uh, are contained, then we'll be able to undertake that risk assessment. It's about a thousand kilometres away, but the safe, there's a safe floor. It seems to be kind of a trench between yeah, there right. and here. Does that change the kind of way of modelling? It does, in a, quite a complicated way, which I'll get you to explain. I couldn't explain it prior. Yeah, it, it sure does. The waves we see hitting New Zealand are a function of the wave that was started where the earthquake was and the path it takes to get to our coastlines. So in this deep water of the trench, mm. the, the waves move very, very quickly. And that, that means that those array waves arriving in, say, East Cape are arriving before those in North Cape that take a slower path. So the, the um, seafloor absolutely um, makes an impact. And then as waves get into shallower and shallower um, shorelines, then they start to get taller and taller and slower and slower. Minister, I mean, I who are up on hill, have you um, had any advice around, you know, food supplies, water supplies, getting out to those people given the, the time in which they need to wait there? Yeah, absolutely. So I've been in touch with a number of the local uh, civil defence teams to check on what types of supplies are being provided. Uh, my understanding is that there are multiple resources that have been stood up to uh, to service the communities, and that's something that we'll be, I guess, checking on throughout the course of the day, depending on the length of time that people are required to be up in those highlands. We have a number of reports of the Waitangi River and the Whangarei Town Basin emptying, and the water that does that has remained there has changed colour. Can you confirm that? And if it has done that, what does that mean? You want to make a I, well, I'll make a first comment. Um, we are still gathering that information and impact data as it is coming in, but uh, perhaps Bill might have a general comment. Yeah, I, I haven't heard any of that information, but we did flag um, the area, the coastal zone around Whangarei as one of the places early on that might be subject to some of our biggest waves in New Zealand. Um, so I, it's, um, it's not outside our expectations to see changes in the currents there and changes in the water behaviour. Minister, uh, Mr. Fry mentioned uh, time saves lives. This morning, were lives at risk and are lives still at risk? Yeah, look, when those evacuation notices go out, that's when there is, uh, it is considered that there is a risk to life. So when you are asked to evacuate, that's at the forefront of our team's notifications to people. Uh, and you don't ask people to do that lightly. So you would have heard, for example, earlier this morning, there was a range of comments about some people getting notices and some not. The assessment was done based on that risk to life component. Uh, if you were assist, uh, assessed as maybe it being a marine threat only, so where we could see that there was going to be some impact in the waters, but it wouldn't be so significant that it would cause risk to life, you probably didn't get the siren going off. But if you were within that area, uh, it was a loud penetrating uh, siren that got people up and then obviously that caused uh, people to move into action. And just, just uh, in terms of a message to Kiwis who are feeling really anxious, who are mm. feeling really worried about this, what, what do you say to them? Yeah, I think, look, that's absolutely natural to feel at the moment. Uh, the messaging that's been coming out all day is, of, is very likely to cause high levels of anxiety. What we're asking people is to try and stay calm, touch people that you love, uh, check on the people that you know might be most at risk, um, and to uh, really just listen to the advice that is coming through. There is very good messaging available to people. I know that within the communities that are, have been evacuated, there are hands on deck volunteers through to professionals that are there to assist, to be able to provide uh, that kind of hands on, uh, I guess, um, uh, 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 guidance uh, that may be required for some. So please do reach out. It's absolutely natural in these times to feel high degrees of anxiety, and there's plenty of people there that are, are, are able to be able to walk alongside you at the moment. Minister, given that Great Barrier is, is part of Auckland and they are under the level three restrictions at the moment, how should they balance it? You mentioned before that the civil defence overrides the COVID restrictions, so they should be listening to the Instructions. That's absolutely correct. So that's absolutely correct. In this circumstance, the civil defence messaging and instructions override the COVID ones for now. So how does that work? So should they get to high ground and if they can be two metres apart, they do that, but no. if not? 
No, no, no. It's it, for now that is the the civil defence response overrides. So get to the Highland. That's the thing that we're asking uh, people to do in these circumstances. That's the priority. Just in terms of um, rural, isolated coastal communities, some are taking higher ground, which is still quite close to the coast. Is the advice to stay there or to move as far inland as possible? Yeah, look, no, as the, the advice is to get to Highland, so the risk has been assessed for those areas that have been asked to evacuate. Between one to three metres is the expectation that that wave may get to. So if they're at high points, uh, that is sufficient. Also, some whānau are going inland, which is also appropriate as well. Uh, did you want to add anything there? I would, I would just add that uh, going up or going inland, both options are valid. Um, and uh, it depend, what, what, what we recommend is um, to check your local local um, tsunami evacuation plan arrangements um, and if it's possible to do that at this point, um, that is the information that uh, we, we would like people to follow. Um, but they've done the right thing, they've made themselves safe and, um, and that's exactly the reaction that we wanted to, to get. Also, in those in those communities, I will say, Fati, is that you've got like exceptional uh, stewards, like Te Araroa, the firefighters. It's everybody's nannies, uncles, kōros are in those trucks, telling everybody to get up high, putting them where they know that they should be. Uh, you've got people like Ngāti Puro Radio that are on the lines to everybody. Those channels in those particularly rural communities are really interlinked, which is helpful in these times of stress. Uh, when the alarm went at 2:29 this morning, those communities were the first to up and mobilise and they knew exactly what to do, so that's pretty heartening from our perspective. And videos are just coming out of Tukumaru Bay of a uh, first wave. Is this something that um, you had planned for? Mm. Well, first of all, I would ask that hopefully people aren't getting too close to be able to see that, uh, that wave, so please do head to the highlands or head inland. We don't want to see anybody at risk of life, uh, but look, that is consistent with what we expect to see over the course of the day, uh, that there will, be, um, there will be these surges and they will um, move in momentum over time. Bill, you may want to add to that, but that's, that's, that, that'll be the course of today. Jenna. Some people who received the cancellation of the warning, but not the actual warning itself. What went wrong there? <clears throat> Um, are you referring to the emergency mobile alert? OK, so um, we'll have a look afterwards to see um, if there was anything there in the technical transmission uh, that we can improve on, but th there could be a couple of reasons why that would happen. Um, if people are on the fringes of, of uh, reception and, and, and came in and out of that, I don't know. Um, and those messages are punched out through cell phone towers. Sometimes they are on the boundaries of... Um, um, of uh, sorry, on the edges of boundaries that, as we've defined them for evacuation. So there's a couple of things there to look at. Um, we do um, make um, best efforts to get those out to the areas where people need to evacuate, so life safety, not to the areas where people, where, where it's uh, um, a, a lower level of risk. Team, as you can appreciate, sorry, just that there is a lot, there are a lot of moving pieces at the moment and we will want, need to uh, move swiftly, so maybe if there's just the last couple of questions. Um, will you update us again in a, in a media conference and also are you planning on heading out to some of those regions mm. today or tomorrow or yeah, well, as you'll know, Jess, it's home, so I want to get home as soon as I can. My bub is up there and they're all being evacuated. But, look, right now we, um, uh, the, we are going to be in, uh, I guess, shoulder to shoulder around that operational table for the course of the next day until we can see that there's been some real movement in those uh, levels. Uh, when it's uh, appropriate for me to get home, I'll definitely be doing that and meeting up with uh, folks on the ground. In terms of our next media briefing, it will really depend um, on what happens over the course of the day, I'd say. The Prime Minister obviously as well has a stand-up at four o'clock. Uh, but uh, So we'll, we'll, we'll work to work with you to notify. Oh, they're OK. They're, um, they're all together. Uh, and, um, uh, yeah, they're all together. And it's, that's kind of the, the state of play for a lot of our families in uh, the regions at the moment. It was a bit of a shock uh, trying to work out what to do, uh, but very swiftly people pulled themselves together, got their backpacks, uh, got into the cars and have by and large congregated either inland or up high and, uh, you know, now watching it all unfold. So really grateful that people are following that, the, the safety advice. Yeah. Just ask a couple of questions of um, you, Mr Fry. Um, what, what activity have you, been, have you seen so far at the coastline? What should Kiwis look at? What, what should we be expecting? And does the activity uh, in the Kermadex, does that, will that lead to seismic activity actually centred on land in New Zealand? 
Uh, so the first question, what should the coastal communities be looking out for? I think I would um, I would refer to what the CDM groups tell them to do. So what, what the advice is. So hopefully they're not standing at the coast watching the waves. Hopefully they're in a, a safe place. What we expect scientifically through the course of the day, we, we expect a series of waves to come in. Some of the, the local harbors might even have energy. They might even have waves sloshing around from the earlier earthquakes today. When you get the, the waves from this 8.1 most recent earthquake superimposed on that, I mean, you, you can get a lot of wave energy bouncing around. So for some time, um, especially um, harbors that we know are susceptible to this sort of effect, they're going to they're going to be fluctuating um, for quite a few hours um, through the day. Your second question was the um, likelihood of triggering earthquakes in New Zealand. That's relatively small. Um, so there there is always a, a potential to trigger an earthquake, like we've seen today with these three earthquakes. But the likelihood of that happening is relatively minor compared to our overall hazard in New Zealand. Okay, thank you, Tim. I will wrap it up now. Cheers. All right, that is the Minister for Emergency Management, Kitty Tapu Allen, Roger Ball, who's the National Emergency Management, uh, Management Agency Director, and Bill Fry from GNS wrapping up a press conference from the Beehive Theatre this morning. So, just to reiterate the main points from that press conference uh, this morning, tsunami warnings remain in place for much of our after an 8.1 magnitude earthquake that centred near Rangitahua, the Kermadec Islands, just after 2.30 this morning. We have been advised by the Minister that those warnings are unlikely to be lifted for some time. So if you've moved to higher ground, you've heeded those civil defence warnings and you're waiting at the moment, be prepared to wait for a few hours. This is what Kitty Tapu Allen said, quote, the official all clear will be given when we have the advice that it is safe to do so. Do not leave those areas until you have the all clear. So if you are waiting at high ground at the moment, the advice is to keep on waiting. And we have also uh, just been told that the Marsden Oil Refinery, which is at Marsden Point, that has now been evacuated. That's all we know for now. Our reporters will be working on that and we'll bring you more information when we can. Uh, Kiri Tapu Allen also calling it an extraordinary morning uh, with what we've been dealing with, a swarm of earthquakes. Uh, she has said people have done the right thing. Uh, and talking about the timing and the fact that you may be there for a while where you're uh, that you might get tired and bored, uh, but it's very, very important not to leave. Yeah. Uh, stay where you are. Uh, there was no way to predict these earthquakes, one of the scientists talked about. They, uh, once it had happened, they knew there would be more, but there was no way of predicting that first one. Uh, so no time frames, as Jack said, don't go sightseeing. The first waves that could come through, if at all, could be smaller than what's to come. Mm. We know that from a lot of those high vantage point points, things look really at the moment, but that is no reason to leave those points. We're going to get some um, updates later on from the officials in Wellington this afternoon. It's likely that the warnings could be lifted in a staggered process. So, so some regions might have the warnings lifted before others, but of course the One News team is right over the story. They're going to be bringing you updates throughout the afternoon. There has been a little, little bit of confusion though about uh, the, the warnings that have been issued for Auckland. Shortly before that press conference began, many people in the Auckland region received an alert from civil defence on their phones. Our reporter Andrew McFarlane is standing by and has the official advice from civil defence officials. Kia ora, Andrew, what can you tell us? Kia ora, Jack. Well, it's important to know the message for Aucklanders is no, you do not need to be evacuating. And this piece of advice that went through the civil defence alert, it's actually advice we've had since early this morning. It's just talking about those strong and unusual currents which will be sighted at Auckland beaches. So really that alert you will have got to your phone if you live in the Auckland region is to just stay away from the water, not to be swimming or not to be going out in a boat either. So that's not an evacuation notice, but more of a watch at this stage. And, and Andrew, Andrew, sorry to interrupt, just to be really clear, that advice applies to people on both coasts in the Auckland region, doesn't it? So it's not just people on the east coast, it's people on both the east and the west coasts. Yeah, we're talking the west coast of Auckland, Manuko Harbour as well. So those are, those are areas in and around the region, it's not just particular parts. So also, as reiterated there, you will be able to find all the advice on the Civil Defence website. But what's happening there in Auckland, it's not just an Auckland region thing. A lot of beaches in and around New Zealand have got these alerts, just telling people, hey, you probably 
probably don't need to be going to the water at the moment. You can see a shot there of a pretty empty looking beach. That's Orewa Beach at the moment. And we've got Cheltenham Beach here as well. A few people milling around there, but the advice is don't get in the water, don't be getting in a boat, maybe don't be going fishing. We also had a little bit of extra detail there from the scientists talking about the size of the waves we could be expecting. So in those areas where there's an evacuation notice, those surges could be between one to three metres. But for those uh, areas elsewhere where those watches are sort of in place, those are waves up to about a metre. But also you have to remember, we've been told this quite a few times now, those first waves that could arrive aren't necessarily the strongest ones and these aren't just like a typical wave at the beach it's a surge so it's almost a wall of water that comes in so don't take any chances and stay out of the water. Kia ora Andrew thank you so much that is One News reporter Andrew McFarlane he will bring us all the very latest information from authorities for people in the Auckland region just as soon as it comes to hand. I was also going to mention Jack and I were sitting next to each other when those alerts came through he got one on his phone I didn't on mine uh, so just also a good reminder that if you think everybody's getting these alerts, maybe people aren't. Uh, so do try and get in touch with uh, people if you can to let them know that Auckland now has a stay away from the coastline uh, warning out because they do know it's alert level three at the moment. Uh, a lot of kids are at home uh, and a lot of families are spending a lot of time cycling or being down near the coast uh, to fill in the day. So uh, do let people know if you got it, not everyone did. Uh, so do make sure that message keeps getting passed along. We're going to head to Kaitaia now where evacuation happened a little earlier and pupils of Kaitaia Abundant Life School are among those being moved and we got one of their teachers, Opi Assam, he, uh, Assam sorry, he's on the phone. Uh, kia ora. Um, how are things going? Oh, sorry, Opi, can you hear me? Oh no, so we've lost OP up in Kaitaia. So uh, I've heard that a lot of uh, kids have been evacuated to near the airport in Kaitaia. We will try and catch back up with them um, soon. Political reporter Mikey Sherman was at the press conference in Wellington at the Beehive Theatre. She's back with us again now. Tēnā koe, Mikey. Uh, what was the, uh, uh, the standout point for you from the press conference? Really, the information from the minister at the moment is that if you're uh, waiting in place, it could be some time before those tsunami warnings are lifted. Kia ora Jack, well yes that's right, I think that is the big takeaway uh, for those people who are in those areas of concern in regards to safety, those people who are up on higher ground they would have been waiting to hear just how long perhaps they may be sitting there waiting it out and it does seem as though they will be there at least perhaps until this afternoon of course as you mentioned earlier though uh, the Minister there did talk about perhaps a staggered approach and uh, that when the, the risk level uh, in some areas does decline uh, perhaps they can return to their homes uh, a bit earlier than other areas. So it is just a waiting game. Uh, I was interested, though, to hear from the Minister around what sort of uh, food and water supply uh, some of these communities can expect in terms of that support for them as they wait out uh, this time. And, of course, she said that she has already been in contact uh, with those civil defence groups on the ground in those communities, uh, ensuring that those uh, support services and supplies uh, stood up for them. So uh, hopefully that was a reassuring message uh, for all of those families, women, men, children uh, who did make the early morning uh, crawl up those hills today uh, and who are now just waiting with bated breath uh, just to see how it all unfolds for them. And Mikey, I know we asked you this before the press conference starts, but have you any update for us as to the post-Cabinet press conference that was scheduled this afternoon to update New Zealanders on the potential change to alert levels? Look, no update uh, as yet, and as they say, no news is good news, and I think that will be the case for Aucklanders. They will be still wanting to know what does happen with those COVID-19 alert level changes. We are expecting that press conference at 4pm to still go ahead uh, with the Prime Minister uh, to this afternoon, so no doubt uh, the Prime Minister uh, and Cabinet uh, will be meeting uh, just to go over the latest case uh, numbers. If there are any new community cases uh, today, we have seen five days now of zero cases in terms of mm. the community so uh, you know there is a lot of pressure on on cabinet to make a decision around those alert levels and so I don't think there will be any appetite to uh, perhaps postpone uh, that decision of course things could change if the situation in regards to those uh, currents and surges of the water changes as well uh, but at this stage it's very much on track for that 4pm press conference.
Xi Xi Hoa, you guys are going to be earning your weekend. <laughs> that is uh, One News political <laughs> reporter. It's my. <laughs> oh, don't say it's your Monday because that's that's very dangerous. That's very no, dangerous. No, it's my it's my birthday weekend. Oh, Hardy hoodie though, kia koe. Thank you so much, Mikey. We will let you um, get away and hopefully I don't know get a slice of carrot cake or something like that um, while you can. So we're we're expecting to bring you that latest update um, on the alert levels that are currently in place for COVID-19 at four o'clock this afternoon. That is the current scheduled press conference. That'll also be in the Beehive. But of course, throughout the afternoon, the One News team is going to be bringing you up to date with the very latest for the tsunami warnings that have been issued around Aotearoa. At the moment, uh, there is no indication as to when those warnings might be lifted. We understand they could be staggered, so people in different regions might have their warnings lifted at different times. Yeah, so the message is really remain where you are. You might get bored, it might get tiring, uh, and you may have little food, but please do stay wa where you are while the officials uh, look into everything and until they can give Clear. We're going to now take a look at how people are reacting around the country, starting in Auckland's Piha, where police have been on the beach. Uh, swells, well, they are looking relatively normal there uh, when these shots are taken. <laughs> They're always massive, aren't they? 11 I mean, 15. Yeah. Uh, people should stay away from the sea. Uh, need to go out and do some yelling if you are close to the sea at these people uh, with much of the country under a marine alert where there could be abnormal surges in coastal areas. And we're also going to give you some pictures from Tokuma near Tolaga Bay, north of Gisborne. Uh, this video posted online appears to show a swell approaching the shoreline. Uh, as you can see, the person who filmed it is at high ground, and we are going to bring you any developments from around the country when we can. Taking a look now at Auckland's Oriwa, where earlier this morning, stand-up paddle borders were out. The advice is to stay away now from all Auckland coastal areas, including harbours, estuaries and beaches. Yep, and this is a live shot of Oriwa. Uh, you can see it's a pretty high tide, but I think high tide was expected about this time today. Uh, nobody there, which is a good thing. And one area under evacuation is Whakatane, where locals have heeded the advice of officials. Many have moved to higher ground, including in nearby Opotiki and Matata. Here's what some in the area told our reporter, Sam Calway. Well, there's a lot of people up here and we've just evacuated the town. It's like a ghost town. Well, half past two in the morning. I live in an apartment down on the riverfront and, and normally it doesn't shake there, but uh, it was shaking. Yeah, what so it's, like? it's pr pretty scary. It was, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, you know, I was driving towards Whakatane from Ohiwa. I got the alert call on the radio station and on my phone. So coming up here and thinking, oh, well, I'll go down Whakatane and see if this is, you know, safe place, but no, the police just turned up me around to come back up here. We don't like to witness today. No. Evidence is going to come. No, indeed. So everybody doing the right thing there up high uh, in high ground. Sean Hogan is also on high ground. He's up on Hospital Hill in Napier. Kia ora, Sam. I mean, Sean, sorry, a few people around. Um, how's it going where you are? Yeah, um, yeah. as you said, Melissa, I'm up on Hospital Hill with a lot of uh, Napier residents who have uh, had to come up here uh, just in the last hour, actually, as they've gathered here now as there's been a call to evacuate uh, red tsunami evacuation zones uh, areas in Hawke's Bay. You'll see a lot of high vis behind me, and that's because uh, the Napier port actually sits in one of those zones. So they've evacuated all their staff uh, up here and are waiting it out just to be safe. Um, I understand police and emergency services are going uh, door to door in those red uh, tsunami evacuation zones in Hawke's Way. But if you know you are in one of those areas, they're likely to be by the beach or riverside uh, that you do get to higher ground immediately. The first earthquake, as we know, woke a lot of New Zealanders up um, in their thousands, including myself. Uh, and it was initially around 2.30 uh, being felt uh, for over a minute. Um, people didn't wait around for that official warning, though. A lot of them got to higher ground, especially in areas like Halmoana on the coast here in Hastings and Hawke's Bay. Uh, so they were really taking that message seriously of um, to evacuate if they feel a long or strong earthquake. Uh, they were allowed to go home around 4.30, but uh, as we have seen this morning, things can change rapidly. So I'll just repeat that information that we've had in the last hour, that people in uh, red tsunami evacuation zones, which can be found on the Civil Defence website uh, in Hawke's Bay, are being advised to get 
sent to higher ground uh, immediately due to the tsunami risk. Uh, but it appears New Zealanders, as you'll see around me, are reacting really well to uh, the messages uh, that the government is putting out and that civil defence are putting out, and people are just keeping safe. On um, loads of low-lying areas where you are, uh, so what's happening with schools and things, they would be out as well? Yeah, so the idea is that um, uh, Hawke's Bay is sort of broken up into a lot of different uh, tsunami ex evacuation zones. The red ones are, are more of those low-lying areas near the coastline. You move through to orange and yellow, which are not at risk at the moment. Hawke's Bay Civil Defence have put out that message to evacuate if you are inside one of those red zones. I understand that there are a few sort of coastal schools in the area that have made their way up to the hill or to higher ground or further inland. So the message is really to be aware of what zone you are in and if you haven't learned now it's about time that you did uh, because these events can happen in the middle of the night as we know uh, but yeah people people from uh, businesses to the port have all had to uh, I guess scamper up here on the hill just to wait it out it's hot people don't know how long they're going to be waiting here but it's better to be safe than sorry in this situation yeah, yeah just on that you've got a few uh, people in the background uh, <laughs> having a bit of fun with you but oh, there uh, he is. tell me is everyone prepared you know, did people bring up food and things like that? I mean, as you said, and as Kiri uh, Tapu Allen has now said, it could be a long wait. Yeah. Yeah, I'm looking around and there tends to be uh, a lot of people with water bottles, there's a lot of the port staff handing those out, a lot of people have managed to grab their lunch boxes before, before they came up here, so they seem relatively prepared. There's a few uh, people without sun hats though, so I'm expecting a few burnt faces out of this, if nothing. Yes, a packed lunch would have been a benefit today. Thanks so much, <laughs> Sean Hogan. We will catch up with you again soon, no doubt. We're going to uh, make our way up the east coast of the North Island at the moment um, from uh, Hawke's Bay up to Fakatani, K Fakatani are Sam Kelway. Uh, Sam Kelway standing by for us on top of a hill there. Kia ora Sam, what's, it, uh, what's happening where you are? Oh, kia ora Jack. Well, it's actually quite a uh, peaceful mood up here at the moment. There's probably about 20 to 30 people uh, just waiting and listening on their phones, checking in to find out what is happening. As we heard through that press conference earlier, that, you know, people are told just to sit tight. It is incredibly hot. And in fact, as I made my way down to the car, I had to find some, some new batteries. Everyone was glued to their phone. They were listening on the radio and they were also watching to see what that press conference uh, was happening. Uh, you might see there's also some school kids in the background who are probably getting a little bit bored. I hope you didn't see the, the bright flashes that went past me. But I was speaking to some of those boys before from Whakatane High School. They'll probably be in trouble with their principal now. And they did say up the road about two or three k's, there's thousands of kids who have evacuated to that higher zone. So it's good to see that students and teachers are moving to higher ground. Uh, where we are at the moment is at least 30, 40 metres uh, high. To the left of me is the Whakatane River. Uh, we saw the tide coming in earlier on but it wasn't a, a high tide there was no rush of water it was purely just the marine tides taking place however when I looked about 20 minutes later the boats had spun around so whether there is some activity in the water hence the uh, experts are telling us to stay out there could be some movement there but certainly no waves at this stage okay thanks for that Sam we're just gonna take a quick live shot of the beach at Whakatane at the moment so no uh, obvious unusual signs there in the water at the moment we have cameras set up right around Aotearoa so if we do see anything unusual we will make sure to bring you those pictures just as soon as we have them and if you are killing time somewhere safe at the moment if you're at higher ground waiting on any updates from authorities and you have some interesting pictures from uh, the things you are seeing as you wait out these tsunami warnings please get in touch with the one news newsroom and we will share them and a great thing at the moment is if all we're dealing with is a rogue Fakatane school student <laughs> running in front of Sam. So it's better to be mooning than to be um, moving to lower ground yes, at the moment. Yes, that okay? is a good thing. Probably but better to do neither. <laughs> so we're going to head to Kaitaia now where evacuations happened a little earlier. Pupils of Kaitaia Abundant Life School are among those being moved out. We've got one of their teachers, Opie Sam, on the phone. Kia ora, Opie, how are you going? Uh, good morning, how are you doing? Or good afternoon. We're OK, how are you? Yeah, it's been a busy morning, an exciting Friday, but um, everything sort of settled a little bit. The kids uh, uh, were being uh, really kindly hosted by another school up here, Tilangi Aniwa Niwa. I teach at a Bunnan High School, and uh, the kids are just swapping items, musical items, singing to each other, and um, just trying to keep the mood positive. Um, 
and look after our little ones who are a little bit upset, but um, generally things have calmed down since this morning. OP, tell me what happened this morning. How did it play out? Yeah, so uh, around about 9.30, um, I'm the music teacher at Abundant Life School, so we had music lessons happening and kids going to lessons and stuff. And then at about 9.30, we had a, a alarm go off in all and um, so as a staff, uh, our principal, Mr. Mark Jan, got us together and we sort of, we contacted buses and we got four buses, got our whole school onto it. There's about 250 kids and we moved them uh, up to where Kaitaia Airport is, um, which is the highest point that's closest to us. Um, so probably took us less than an hour to get the kids on the bus and up to the airport and sort of settling in. It's a pretty big adventure for a Friday morning and you mentioned a wee bit of uh, upset amongst some kids. How are they going? Because they're, they're separated from other family at the moment. Yeah, look, we've got a couple of senior kids, uh, you know, um, who's, who are from um, the East Coast. Uh, some of them haven't heard from their families yet, um, but we're doing the right thing and hopefully we are and, and sort of keeping them with us um, and just trying to still get through to their families. Um, and some of our little ones, uh, we've called their parents to let them talk to them on the phone or even on, um, you know, Messenger to sort of FaceTime and uh, just to try and do what we can to keep them, you know, sort of um, settled and, um, and OK, really. You sound like you're doing an excellent job, OP. What's the plan for the rest of the day? Uh, no, I'm not sure, really, to be honest. We're just kind of, um, the kids are at the moment sharing uh, musical items uh, with Aniwaniwa um, School. Um, going back and forth and just, um, you know, keeping them hydrated. Uh, we're now inside the a new, a new school uh, gym, which is really kind of them to let us. And I think uh, some of the parents have picked up their children and taken them home. And then I guess for us, really, it's just waiting and, and making sure that we're up to date with all the, uh, the needs from around the country and especially for us around this, um, the far north area. Uh, they have said it could be a bit of a long wait. Have you got enough food and supplies? Uh, yeah, we've got, uh, we're sort of in the process of still of organising uh, more water and um, cups of tea and, and the kids, uh, you know, most of them have their lunch boxes with them, so, but I think we're getting through them pretty quickly. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, we might have to uh, see what else we can source while we're up here waiting, so we'll see how we go. Well, it's like me when I bring my work to lunch, it's gone <laughs> by 10 o'clock, <laughs> isn't it, Opie? We all know what that's like. Um, and what are you seeing around, I know you haven't probably moved much from where you are, but we when you travelled to uh, Kaitaia Airport, what was the traffic like? What are you seeing around the area? Yeah, when, when we were going from uh, our school up to Kaitaia Airport, the traffic coming into Kaitaia was, uh, of course, unusually heavy. Um, I'm assuming a lot of parents were coming in. Uh, of course, there are other schools around our area, um, and lots of parents were picking up their kids. So the traffic was pretty heavy at that time, probably between, um, I'd say, 9.30 and 11, I guess, the initial chaos, I suppose, of, of the, of the uh, evacuation. Um, lots of people um, just basically looking after their families and, um, you know, for us as teachers, really, we're just trying to shift 250 kids safely, um, you know, on buses up to the airport. And then from there on, we're sort of keeping in touch with their families who may want to come and pick them up. It sounds like you are doing a tremendous job, OP Sam. Thank you so much for joining us. That's OP Sam. He's a teacher up in Kaitaia, moving 250 kids this morning to safety. <sighs> That's a tough gig. <laughs> At the Especially best of time. when you've eaten your lunch. Especially when you've eaten your lunch. And it's always a Friday, isn't it? Um, just before 11.30 this morning, uh, warnings were extended to people in the Auckland region. They haven't been told to evacuate, but they have been told to stay away from the water. Reporter Logan Church is at North Head on Auckland's North Shore. It's a spectacular spot for watching America's Cup racing at the best of times. But Logan, what are you seeing there at the moment? Kia well, there are certainly quite a few people here watching out the eastern coastline, um, all eyes out to the sea. Um, actually, down in the beaches this morning, um, it was pretty much business as um, usual. People were out and about taking advantage of the beautiful seaside we have uh, here in Dorkland. However, of course, at 10.35 this morning, that text notification came out from Civil Defence um, informing that there was a tsunami threat. Now, while people are not being told to evacuate at this stage, they 
are being told to stay away from those beaches and those seaside areas around Auckland. Um, we um, did a bit of a drive-by before and uh, the beaches are relatively empty but there were still certainly quite a few people um, out and about. We've seen some paddle boarders and some dog walkers perhaps haven't got the message just as of yet, um, but we do understand that the police are, um, are out and about telling people to get away from the beaches um, at, at this stage. Um, all eyes, I guess, peeled um, uh, to, to people's phones and to news outlets trying to figure out exactly what the uh, next steps, but uh, certainly everyone's very calm here um, and I, I guess just looking uh, ahead to see what comes over the next few hours. The good news is that most people seem to have moved off the beaches. Are you seeing any activity on the water itself? Because where you're located is a perfect vantage point for assessing activity at the port and out in the Hauraki Gulf. Well, it's certainly quite quiet. As I said before, we can see um, some paddleboarders or they might have just moved off before but there were certainly some people um, out and about before but the uh, the bays and the seas do seem um, at least at this stage quite quiet people seem to be heeding that advice to stay away from the beaches um, and stay away from the from the coastlines um, of course as the day progresses people will be keeping a very close eye on those civil defense um, civil defense alerts and notifications to sort of see what the situation um, I guess it gets to as the day goes on all right thank you so much much Logan I know you're going to be stationed there for us throughout the afternoon these are live pictures from Auckland Sky Tower looking northeast to Rangitoto at the moment it looks like um, Rangitoto is getting a good drenching right at this minute it's probably important to point out in case you're not a geography nerd that people on both the east and the west coast in the Auckland regions have been told to stay away from the water. So that's the, Piha? Yep, that's Piha, that's Bethel's, that's Muriwai, yeah, as well as the Hauraki Gulf. Oriwa. Exactly, yep. yeah. Uh, my thing would be that Jack and I were both sitting here. Jack got the um, civil defence emergency on his phone, the alert, and I didn't. So not everybody is, so do make sure you check in with people. If you think there's a chance that they could be up walking or biking with the kids, uh, Make sure you get on your phone tree activated mm. and let some people know. Uh, we did have a press conference about an hour ago. Here are the main points from that with Kitty Tapu Allen, the Emergency Management Minister. People who have moved to high ground in affected coastal areas should remain, should remain where you are until you're given official all clear. Officials are warning people to stay off the beaches and out of the water at the moment across large parts of Aotearoa. Make sure you out the Civil Defence website for details. That's Civil Defence with a C, civildefence.govt.nz. Severe sea surges are expected for several hours. Of today's three earthquakes, the first and the third are definitely related, according to scientists, and they may be followed by further earthquakes. And Auckland hasn't been asked to evacuate, but there is a marine and beach warning. That means stay out of the water and the beaches today. Do not go sightseeing. Here is a list of all places and the estimated times of arrival for any waves. Parts of the west coast of the North Island from Cape Reanga to Ahipara and the east coast from Cape Reanga to Whangare. From Matata to Tolaga Bay including Whakatane and Opotiki and uh, Great Barrier better. Island. Other areas can expect strong and unusual surges near the shore. Waves may not have hit yet but the Reminder, they still could come in the next few hours. Yeah, those times are the estimates that we received from officials. However, uh, there have been some reports of unusual activity in some of the coastal regions around New Zealand. In Whangarei, we've heard reports of some unusual coastal and tidal movements. At the moment, uh, scientists uh, at NEMA in the Beehive say they're assessing that data, but they're not going to lift warnings in the, until they can be absolutely sure that everyone is safe. If you missed this morning's press conference, this this is some of what Emergency Management Minister Kiri Tapu Allen had to say. Well, kia ora tatau, uh, tuatahi. Uh, first, I just want to acknowledge that this has been an extraordinary morning for many New Zealanders up and down the country. Uh, from 2.30 this morning, essentially, some people have been up worried about their homes, their families. 
I've had the, uh, throughout the course of this morning, uh, I've been briefed by my colleagues here. I have Roger Ball, who is the National Director from the National Emergency Management Agency, and GNS science expert Bill Fry with, here, with me as well, who will be able to elaborate on some of the causes for what's happened this morning, as well as the way that the uh, approach to this event has been managed. But first, I do want to acknowledge the people of uh, Te Tairawhiti, the East Coast, those up in Pewhairangi in the Bay of Islands, those where, uh, that have had to pick up their homes, pivot and evacuate and have done so exceptionally well. The messaging was, uh, when it is long or strong, get gone. This morning, whether that was at 2.30 or whether that was later on throughout the course of the morning, we saw New Zealanders literally adhere to their advice. They felt the long or strong earthquakes and they knew to grab their bag and head into the highlands. Yes, it sounds like everybody is doing the right thing this morning. A little bit of news that came in half an hour or so ago. The Marsden Point oil refinery has been evacuated in response to the tsunami alert. It's unclear how many staff were moved from the location, but it's understood fewer people were on site due to maintenance. Residents have also been advised to get to higher ground in the area. We're going to head to Helen Castles. Uh, she is our Northland reporter. She spent the morning with evacuees in Doubtless Bay in Northland. Uh, kia ora, Helen. How are you going? Yeah, good morning. Well, you might be able to hear that siren in the background. It's been going all morning. Uh, surges have been spotted all up and down the Northland coastline. I'm uh, here in Taipa, up on the hill, where we witnessed a massive surge before, where the sand was literally ripped away. Um, it looks as though it's high tide, but that's a couple of hours away at least. So how are people handling it up there? I know you're with a crowd of people from earlier today. Yeah, look, um, all the schools um, in the low-lying areas have been evacuated um, and that includes some schools that aren't even at, in a risky spot and that's simply because a lot of the students there uh, go or live in coastal communities. Um, but the communities are definitely pulling together. There's lots of people just parked up on the hillside and those that live nearby are bringing them water and food um, and, and, yeah, everyone's really just helping one another out. How many people are up where you are? Oh, there's a couple of dozen, and um, I've actually been lucky enough to be invited back to someone's home where I've got a great <laughs> view, along with all the other people that were evacuated, and uh, Mark Osborne is, is the generous person here, and he's actually been bringing us water and biscuits, um, every, everything that, we, that anyone needs. Oh, that's what you do need at a time like that. Thanks so much, Helen. Uh, we will talk to you again soon. Yeah, we have reporters stationed right around Aotearoa working to get you the very latest um, as we continue to cover this developing news event. So the advice from the national um, authorities so far has been that if you are waiting on higher ground, wait in place for the time being, even though earlier today they gave us estimates for when waves or surges might affect different parts of coastal New Zealand. They say the risk isn't over yet. And when they can relax some of those warnings, it may be done in a staggered process. So for example, different regions might be told things are safe, you can go home before other regions are. We just need to wait on the official advice from the people in Wellington. At the moment though, uh, the advice from the National Emergency Management Agency is to move to higher ground if you haven't d done so already because the first wave or the first surge to come through today might not be the strongest. Here's what National Operations Manager Roger Ball had to say. Uh, as I'm sure you are aware, the National Emergency Management Agency issued a tsunami warning this morning following a magnitude 8.1 earthquake northeast of New Zealand near the Kermadec Islands around 9am. The areas under land and marine threat, as the Minister has specified, are the following. The west coast of the North Island from Cape Rianga to Ahipara, the east coast of the North Island from Cape Rianga to Whangarei, from Matata to Tolaga Bay, including Whakatane and Opotiki and Great Barrier Island. Strong and unusual currents and unpredictable surges near the shore may be expected in other parts of New Zealand. This could affect beach, harbour, estuary and small boat activities, so we're advising to play it safe. In those areas, people do need to stay off the beach and out of the water. The full list of those areas is relatively extensive. It is on our website on civildefence.govt.nz. 
The severity of currents and surges will vary over the period this morning uh, is, is um, that the warning is in effect for. We are advising people to stay out of the water, as I say, uh, including the sea, rivers and estuaries, so that includes uh, um, not going out in boats. We ask that people do not go sightseeing. This is important. The first wave may not be the largest. Tsunami activity will continue for several hours and the threat must be regarded as real until this warning is cancelled. Evacuation advice overrides the current COVID-19 alert level requirements. Listen to local civil defence authorities and follow any instructions regarding evacuation of your area. If you are told to evacuate, do not stay at home. Stay two metres away from other people if you are able to safely do so while you evacuate. And that was the latest about an hour ago, but we have just been told there has been another large quake in Rangitahua, that's the Kermadec Islands. Our reporter Katie Bradford has more from our Auckland newsroom. Kia ora Katie. Good afternoon. Yes, we've just had some information coming in from GNS now. Uh, now that is another 6.2 magnitude uh, earthquake, 10 k's deep off the Kermadex. No news yet. We haven't had any uh, of those warnings uh, come through to tell us uh, where that may be impacting. That may be felt, uh, but that is what's just come in from Genius now. That was at about 12.12 12, that quake happened. OK, thank you, uh, Katie. So, so a 6.2 magnitude earthquake. It's important to note that that is smaller than each of the three earthquakes that affected that region earlier today. That being said, of course, uh, there could well be uh, some more warnings to come through from the officials in Wellington. Have you heard any reports of people feeling this 6.2 magnitude earthquake? Not yet, and as you said, that is obviously a lot smaller. Uh, possibly good news that it isn't another one of those 8.1 uh, quakes coming in at this stage, but the fact that we are st they're still coming in will be causing concern. Um, we've obviously seen throughout the morning some of those uh, high, to high tide levels, waves. We've got videos coming in, as you've, if you've been watching, been seeing, uh, of, of the waves in the high water around the country. Uh, so as more quakes happen, that will be creating more concern. Uh, but we have had no, I mean, I've been getting those notifications all morning since 2.30 this morning. Mm. Uh, and we have not had any more warnings as a result of this quake. OK, thank you so much, Katie. I know you're working to bring us the very latest. That's Katie Bradford in the Auckland newsroom. So a 6.2 magnitude earthquake centering near Rangitahua, the Kermadex, at 12.12 this afternoon. That's smaller than each of the earthquakes this morning. However, we were advised in the press conference with the authorities at the um, Beehive Theatre just after 11.30 this morning that there was a significant possibility we would experience some aftershocks, aftershocks. From, from these earthquakes. And it does show that the situation is still quite active, yeah. obviously near the Kermadex. Uh, New Zealand is not the only country with tsunami warnings. Uh, a watch has been issued in Hawaii, with a threat still being assessed there. Officials are also watching the situation for many on the Pacific Islands. A warning is also in place for Norfolk Island off the coast of Australia, but no threat has been identified for the mainland. This is the scene in American Samoa this morning, where residents were told to get to higher ground immediately. You can see them moving pretty quickly there. Of course, people all throughout the Pacific are used to getting these warnings from authorities when we experience yeah, and earthquakes. places like Samoa has seen some pretty deadly and devastating uh, tsunamis before. And it was surreal. That's how a resident of Tokomaru Bay, north of Gisborne, has described the sight of a large wave rolling towards the east coast beach. Claudia Marker had evacuated to higher ground where she captured this video. So, so I think you can, you can just see the waves surging in from the top of the heads there uh, and coming in uh, through into an inlet. I'm not familiar with that area, so I'm not sure if that's a common sight, but the fact that Claudia has sent this into us would suggest it's not. Mm. Uh, so as we've been told, there could be these sea surges, unusual activity in the sea, which is why most of Aotearoa New Zealand is at mm. the moment under these alerts to stay away from coastal areas. Even if the wave doesn't look big, it could still tip you or a small child over yeah. uh, and that is the danger as well as anything bigger that could come through. Claudia's done everything right there. She's at higher ground so she's heeded the warnings of the authorities and she sent us the video so we can uh, see exactly what uh, the concerns are about this morning. If you are in a part of New Zealand this morning where you've been told to evacuate, you're waiting at higher ground, you're wondering what to do, make sure um, if you have some pictures you can send them through to our um, One News team and we will be sure to share them. If you see any unusual activity in Coastal regions would be interested yes, to do see let those us pictures. know. Um, as we know from Kiritapu, Alan, uh, 
we could uh, be here a while. You could be there a while, wherever you are. Uh, the official all clear won't be given until the advice is that it is safe to do so, uh, and that could be some time. Yeah. Uh, she acknowledged that you could become bored or tired. Uh, we do understand that, uh, but do the right thing for the moment and stay at high ground and don't go sightseeing. Uh, for some reason, a lot of us like to flock to the ocean where we hear there's a tsunami alert. It's not worth it. Uh, they talked about in the press conference that time saves lives. The alerts were very early. We could still hear the sirens going off in Helen's live cross. It still is a situation that we are dealing with currently. Yeah. And it's likely that, that they're going to lift these warnings in a staggered process. So it's likely that some parts of New Zealand, uh, that the warnings will be lifted, people will be able to go home while others will have to remain in place for some time until they can be absolutely sure. And as we've just seen in the last half an hour or so, there is no telling whether or not there could be more earthquakes. I know that is a concern a lot of people have. This morning, GNS scientist Bill Fry said there was no warning that any of the quakes that struck this morning would occur. Here's what he told us in that 11.30 press conference. No, no, there's no way we can predict when the earthquakes happen. So the, the first of this morning came um, without any significant warning. Then after that, when we see a big earthquake like this, we know that we're more likely to see another earthquake after that. So we're particularly vigilant after the first earthquake, looking for the um, follow-on earthquakes. Can you explain how the three are connected mm. and, and why they're doing it? And also maybe a comment on how unusual it is to see earthquakes mm. of this size. Yeah. So I, I can comment on how the um, first and the last are related because we have a, a pretty good feel for the physics and the science around that. The second middle earthquake, it's a, it's a bit more tenuous, so it happened quite far away, I think a thousand kilometers away from the first earthquake. When we when we have a big earthquake like the first one at, at two o'clock this morning, we know in the region of the, that's very proximal to that earthquake, the nearby region, we know it's highly likely to have another earthquake. Usually that's not bigger than the first, which is what we've seen today, but it does happen. It's not unexpected um, and then when you get farther and farther away you have to invoke other mechanisms that are a little less certain um, certainly in the, the early hours of a response. How long have you been doing this and, and how unusual is this in your experience? I've been in, in New Zealand um, for 13 years responding to large earthquakes and tsunamis and um, this is the first time we've had this particular um, sequence but every sequence we get um, it's usually complicated and we usually learn from it and that's what I expect we'll do today. OK, so we're just going to take a quick uh, look at how people around the country are reacting to these tsunami alerts. We'll start in Auckland, uh, that is the rugged east uh, west coast in Piha, where police have been on the beach. Swells have been looking relatively normal there uh, when these shots were taken just after 11.15. It's important to note that that is before Aucklanders were given a coastal alert warning to stay away. Uh, we now know that you should be staying away from the beach with much of the country under a marine alert, where they're could be abnormal surges in coastal areas. Uh, staying in Auckland to the east coast now, to Oriwa, where this morning uh, stand-up paddle boarders were out. Hopefully they've now come in on off the water because you must be staying away. Well, the advice at least is to stay away from all Auckland coastal areas, including harbours, estuaries and beaches. Yeah, stand-up paddle boarding is bad at the best of times. <laughs> Today's a really bad day for that. One area that is still under an evacuation order is Whakatane and Bay of Plenty, where locals have heeded the advice of officials. Many moved to higher ground, including in nearby Oportiki and Matata. Here's what some in the area told our reporter, Sam Calway. Well, there's a lot of people up here and we've just evacuated the town. It's like a ghost town. Well, half past two in the morning. I live in an apartment down on the riverfront and, and normally it doesn't shake there, but it was shaking. Yeah, what so it's, it like? it's pr pretty scary. It was, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, you know, I was driving towards Katana from Ohiwa. I got the alert call on the radio station and on my phone. So coming up here and thinking, oh, well, I'll go down to Katana and see this is... You know, safe place, but no, the police just turned up me around to come back up here. Wouldn't like to witness today. No. Evidence going to come. So those are people gathered in Bay of Plenty this morning. We have fresh pictures from a huge surge of water in Tutukaka, which is near Whangarei in Northland. This video was filmed at around midday. We're going to have more information as it comes to hand. But just looking closely there, you can see 
a significant surge of water coming through. This appears to be the Tutakaka Marina. Anyone uh, who has perhaps gone on an outing with dive Tutakaka will be familiar with this area. It's a beautiful part of Aotearoa, but clearly boats there affected by a surge. This video came through at about midday today. And that is an area much like Whangarei, where we've seen those pictures before of the red really surging into a uh, which you know proves why we need to stay away from the water because it might not look dangerous but actually yeah. the currents and unusual surges could be quite strong. Um, we had a press conference at about 11.30. Uh, it does seem like the message is the same but it is a very important message uh, that we must remain where you are. If you're on high ground, uh, stay there and um, wait it out, yeah. I'm afraid. There's, there's no update exa as to exactly when yes. those warnings which might be lifted at will, this stage. Which will be frustrating. <laughs> Uh, but we do have reporter Logan Church. He's at Auckland's North Head, which has a gorgeous view at the best of times of uh, the Waitemata. Uh, what's happening up there, Logan? Well, just have a look at this view behind me. Usually on a day like today, it's very sunny, it's beautiful. The sea behind me would be filled with boats. Today, almost completely empty after that 11.35 a text notification that came through from Civil Defence uh, a little bit earlier on today. Quite a few people up here now. Now, while there hasn't been any um, evacuation orders for this part of Auckland, many people here who live alongside the beach have taken it upon themselves to get to higher ground anyway. We've seen people around here with deck chairs and with books just keeping a really close eye um, out to sea, um, a close eye on the news, a close eye on those notifications coming through from civil defence and what is, uh, of course, a very dynamic, changing uh, situation. Uh, it would be very fair to say, though, that everyone Everyone is very calm, everyone is quite relaxed and they're following the guidelines as they get them from civil defence. Yes, yeah, so what um, the people you've talked to, what have they said? We know that Auckland there is the warning to stay off coastal areas, obviously people are coming out to North Head to have a look. Uh, what are they saying about the situation? Well, there's certainly concerns. People up here are, I guess, acting in an abundance of um, caution. Some have been up here uh, for some time with a, I guess, a nervous eye um, on the horizon. Obviously, nothing to see um, here yet. Um, and it's also worth noting that people here are also keeping in mind that Auckland is still uh, technically dealing with a COVID outbreak. So people here still trying to stay a bit apart from each other. But as I said earlier, people have brought up uh, deck chairs. There's a couple just sitting up the hill with their family. There are quite a few spin dogs running around. around like, so, can you spin uh, the camera yes, around, people... Logan? Sorry, can you spin the camera around and give us a look at yeah. what you're seeing? Absolutely. Well, we see there's people up here on picnic tables with some deck chairs a bit up the hill. Uh, people are certainly relaxed, um, but as I said earlier, really, I guess, um, acting in an abundance of, of caution. They don't want to be caught out. There are, of course, many low-lying coastal areas and suburbs uh, around this part of Auckland. As I, as I said before, there's been no evacuation orders um, other than um, the uh, text notification earlier today at 11.35 warning people to get away from from the uh, from the beaches, um, but people here are, are being careful. Now, if we actually look at the beach behind me, there was a few people um, earlier, uh, just in the last few minutes, down there on the beach. We can see a couple uh, walking up now. Now, the police have been out and about today, telling people around these areas since that 11:35 notification came out to get away from the beach. Um, we've seen they met some of those people who have instead come up here to keep an eye on what's going on. Uh, but certainly, a lot quieter are out here than it would usually be at this time of day um, as people really, I guess, uh, stay tuned to what's happening. Thanks so much, Logan. We'll catch up with you again soon. Yeah, Logan Church is with us from North Head. Uh, people in the Auckland region being told to stay away from the water uh, at the moment. Um, just so you know, we've had an update from uh, the Beehive. They were hoping to have a press conference at about 2 o'clock this afternoon. The message we've had is that that press conference is less likely at the moment, but of course as soon as we get any information from the authorities, uh, we will be sure to pass it on. So such an evolving situation, isn't it? This so is it, Unfortunately yeah. for all of you uh, waiting it out, keep waiting. Keep on waiting, hurry up and wait. Um,
I know a lot of people in Te Waipo Namu, the South Island, have been tuning into our coverage uh, throughout the morning uh, on TVNZ1. And I just want to have a quick update for people in coastal regions of the South Island who are wondering how uh, today's warnings affect them. Now, at the moment, uh, no parts of the South Island are under the coastal inundation or flooding or tsunami risks. However, strong and unusual currents and unpredictable surges near the shore have, uh, have been um, forecast or are expected in the following areas. Areas. Okay, so the west and south coasts of the South Island from Farewell Spit to Pusager Point, including Westport, Greymouth, and Hooky Ticker. The top of the South Island from Farewell Spit to Port Underwood, including Nelson, Picton, and the Marlborough Sounds. The east and south coasts of the South Island from the Waipara River to the, to the Rakaia River, including uh, Christchurch and Banks Peninsula from the Taieri River through to Pusager Point, including Invercargill and Stewart Island. So basically the warnings there for people in the South Island to Waiponamu and Stewart Island uh, are to just be aware th uh, that there could be some unusual coastal activities, there could be some unusual surges um, and currents over the next few hours, but if we have any more information for people in those areas, we will be sure to bring them to you. Uh, that also includes the Chatham Islands, so they should be watching out for that too. Mm. Uh, meanwhile, authorities are praising the public's response after a tsunami warning was issued earlier this morning for a 7.1 magnitude earthquake off the east coast. The quake struck at 227, 105 kilometres east of Te Araroa. East Cape locals were asked to evacuate, but tsunami warnings for the area have now been lifted. One seismologist says it's rare to have two large earthquakes like this. Of course, we've had multiple earthquakes. Just after 12 o'clock, a 6.2 magnitude earthquake was recorded again near the Kermadec Islands. GNS seismologist John Ristow says it's fortunate that none of those earthquakes so far has centred near New Zealand's mainland. Um, one thing about this earthquake that really helped as far as that's concerned is that it was offshore, about 100 kilometres offshore. Um, yes, yeah, so if, if you had put this earthquake like um, um, directly beneath New Zealand, you know, at, at that depth, there probably would have been uh, quite a bit of damage from it. Uh, but being offshore, that, uh, um, you know, that, that means that even the closest people are at least 100 kilometers or so from the epicenter. Yeah, well, um, one thing again with, with, with uh, earthquakes like this being, uh, being um, a deeper earthquake and the type of earthquake it was, they, they tend not to produce um, really long-lived, strong aftershock sequences like a, like a Canterbury-type aftershock sequence. Um, we have had quite a few. We've had um, uh, at least four magnitude five or larger, and uh, a large number of uh, between uh, magnitudes four and five. I think uh, at the moment we've got about 70 aftershocks or so that we've located. Um, there will also be a lot of smaller aftershocks that we can't locate just be the fact that it's an offshore earthquake. So we can really only locate everything about magnitude three, 3.5 and larger. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't expect the aftershocks yeah, to continue for, for, for weeks or anything. Yeah, it's probably for a few days we'll get aftershocks. Yeah, yeah well, to have, uh, to, to, to have them come, you know, like, like one right after the other like that, yeah, that, uh, that is a bit unusual. I mean, earthquakes uh, like the 7.5, for Nirel Island, earthquakes of that size around there are not unusual in and in and of themselves. You know, they uh, they happen. You know, every uh, every few years, maybe even every couple of years. But yes, to have them sort of bang bang like that, that doesn't happen very often. That is scientist John Ristow. Yeah, um, Kitty Tapu Island. Island called it this morning an extraordinary morning. Um, have heard some extraordinary stories from many of you. A teacher in Kaitaia, they organised four buses, got 250 children uh, out of uh, Kiri Kiri rather, and are now having music lessons with another school. Uh, you've rung us if you've been watching the water change to a different colour in uh, Whangarei, Whangarei, I think yep, that was. Uh, we've well. heard from you up on uh, Whakatane, up on the lookout there. If you are uh, listening or if you're watching and you want to send us some footage, uh, do do that. 
into the newsroom. Just don't take any risks. It's really don't important you just risks, remain at higher ground until the authorities uh, says, give you the all clear. Send us a message to your mother if you want to. Now we'll see if we can play it think, so she knows you're safe. If, if we are crowdsourcing for pictures of unusual <laughs> coastal activity, then perhaps we can crowdsource for activities to entertain the kids for this yes. afternoon because I know there will be a lot of people around New Zealand who, as soon as they saw those warnings, went to higher ground and have found themselves any... now... <laughs> yeah. And are now trying to do... Uh things to Sam Calway's <laughs> camera when he's in a live shot. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah so we've got cameras uh, all around the place. So we've got Sam up in Whakatane and we've got Helen in Taipa and Sean also in Napier. Uh, we are across things here as they develop. We have been told the two o'clock uh, press conference that was due to happen may now not be happening. Uh, we can't read it, anything into that. We were told earlier today that this could be a long wait and see situation. They don't want to let anyone uh, converge back into their towns or small Northland towns mm. which have very low lying areas uh, and have something happen. And we know it's stressful, we know it's really stressful, we know it's just another stressor after a very stressful period. We know that parts of Aotearoa are still at level three and that every other uh, region is at level two for COVID-19 alerts at the moment. So yes. there are a lot of people and who are probably already in a heightened state of stress. That was the other advice today was, was if you are isolating or if you're sick at home and thought actually I'm just gonna sit this one out, uh, don't do that, get on the road to high ground or move inland. The advice is to ignore the COVID restrictions for the day and get yourself to safety. Yeah. But we are still expecting, we've had no change on that so far, uh, we are expecting that at four o'clock after Cabinet today, we will also hear about the alert levels. Yeah, so Cabinet will be meeting to discuss the situation regarding the outbreak in Tamaki Makoto over the last week. They're going to make an assessment as to whether or not New Zealand and Auckland can shift alert levels. So we're expecting an update on that at four o'clock this afternoon. And of course, we will bring you that update live as soon as we have uh, that information. Yes, in fact, usually we would be getting the COVID numbers at about now, so I will look that up shortly and see if anything has been released. I'm not sure if we are having a press conference at one. I don't think so today. No, no, we've been told for the time no. being four o'clock will be the update we get from, from, from the Prime Minister and the Director General of Health when it comes to the move in COVID alert levels. Uh, however, if we have any updates as to uh, the number of cases in uh, New Zealand and indeed in the community, of course, we will bring those as soon as we, as soon as we can. But at the authorities in Wellington are just trying to assess all of the different data points that they're receiving. Earlier today, after those three significant earthquakes, the three initial significant earthquakes uh, near the Kermadec Islands, uh, there, there were warnings that indicated potential times for surges or waves to be hitting different parts of New Zealand. Most of those times have now passed. From what we've seen and the information we've received in our newsroom, we haven't received reports of large-scale damage anywhere or anything like that. However, the authorities say it is too early to lift those warnings at this stage. They're waiting until they have more information. They're probably waiting to see the latest impact of the 6.2 magnitude earthquake that occurred just after midday today before they tell anyone who is currently at higher ground under a tsunami warning to move back home. So if you are just joining us for this One News special, we're live across the country as we still remain on tsunami alert. An earthquake struck at 2.27 a.m., 105 kilometres east of Te Araroa. Evacuation orders are still in place for several areas. People in the following areas should evacuate immediately and move inland or to higher ground. On the west coast of the North Island, from Cape Reanga to Ahipara. Over on the east, people in Cape Reanga and through to Whangare should also leave now. People from Matata to Tolaga Bay need to evacuate as well, and that includes Whakatane and Oportiki. Great Barrier Island is under the same warning. Anyone who felt the earthquake, long or strong, should also leave their homes. Much of New Zealand is under a marine alert as well. Stay away from the sea. Head to onenews.co.nz or civildefence.gov.nz for more on your area. Kate Malcolm owns Dive Tutukaka, located on the east coast of Northland, about 45 minutes north of Whangarei. We've been talking to her throughout the morning as she evacuated and made it to higher ground. And we're checking back in with her again now. Kia ora, Kate. Thanks for being with us again. A short while ago, we saw pictures from Tutukaka that suggested the region had been affected by some sort of coastal surge or some strong current. Did you see that? Are you able to tell us anything about that? Anyone there? Oh, 
I think we have a problem connecting with Kate. We will see if we can get that line back up with Kate and um, see if she can give us the latest information. But but we saw a storm surge or some sort of surge coming into Tutukaka and to, to the marina Kate, there. Kate was talking earlier about yeah. how they're well used to this kind of thing. They do drills on it. Uh, they are surrounded by low-lying areas as well as quite high points. Um, so they move inland uh, and they're fully briefed. They had all their boats and uh, she knew that some of them were staying out. Uh, we have now been told if your vessel is in deep water, Water, you should be fine. Uh, we're also hearing that Napier port staff are among those to be evacuated in Hawke's Bay. People living in the red evacuation zone in the region have been advised to head to higher ground. Residents in low-lying areas have been told to stay away from beaches and waterfronts and do stay out of the water. Here's what Napier Port Chief Executive Todd Lawson had to say. It's been a bit of an interesting morning this morning. Um, you know, we had the shake here last night uh, and across the Hawke's Bay, which uh, woke a lot of people up very early in the morning. Uh, and then again, obviously this, this morning, uh, the unexpected uh, 8.3, I think it was, up in the Kermadex. So uh, we're responding now uh, based on the civil defence advisory message that we all got to evacuate the port. We're in the red zone here in Napier. We think uh, everything, we, you know, everyone went to work this morning. Uh, obviously a lot of talk and chatter about what happened last night. We actually um, stopped operations last night as well, in the middle of the night, um, for a period of time. So to make sure everything was safe. Uh, and then, yeah, uh, the notice came through. Uh, our um, warning system that we installed at the port a little while ago, we, we, uh, we uh, yeah, activated that, which is a six siren um, to allow everybody to know what's going on, and then evacuated the port up the, up the hill uh, here at Bluff Hill. It's, it's a big operation. It's a lot of people to, to um, advise and let them know what's going on. Um, luckily, we'd actually run a drill like this uh, several months ago. Installed the tsunami evacuation system on the port, so today's gone incredibly smooth. People knew what to do. They, they you know, calmly exited the port, and as you can see around me, people are sort of comfortably mingling and, and uh, relaxing in the sun, uh, waiting for the all clear to actually be able to go back down into the port itself. So um, it's it's worked really, really well. Very pleased with how it's worked. That is Todd Lawson, who is the CEO of the Napier Ports. We're going to go back now to Kate Malcolm, who owns Dive Tutukaka, just north of Whangarei. Kate. Um, Kia ora. We saw some pictures uh, that suggested uh, Tutukaka had been affected by some sort of coastal surge over the last hour or so. Are you able to tell us anything about that? Yes, it's not something that we didn't expect. It's something that we've seen a number of times before with different tsunamis that we've had, the Japanese, the Chilean and a Samoan um, tsunami. And there's something about the harbour entrance and the marina entrance that just bottlenecks um, the surge as it comes in. It's quite a wide, narrow entrance and then a wide harbour and then it bottlenecks again at the marina entrance. So we knew that um, there was going to be some surge there. So it's kind of comforting that it's doing exactly as it should do. It's coming in um, on, we've been timing the swells coming in. The surge is about four to six minutes. It comes in and it sucks out, at, back out again. The footage that you probably saw was the initial surge coming through. Mm. Now it's just settled into a mucky little yucky undertow that's going to be consistent um, and probably here for the next 12 to 12 really good reason to not head to the coast. That undertow and that nasty little um, surge underneath can trip you up. Yeah, the water looks quite muddy around the marina area in Tutukaka there. So, so, so you say that the initial surge came in and then it died off a bit and then it surged again. Is that how it works from your experience? Yes, it is. It settles into a bit of a pattern. It comes in and then it, it goes back out again. And then you'll see that it kind of mixes a little bit, the swirly eddies, either at the... Um, entrance seems to be halfway out to Phillip Island the, the, um, the bottom gets stirred up quite a lot and also inside the marina. So it kind of refracts back against itself um, and the swirly top, the swirly current that you see on the top is quite different to the undertow that's going to be lurking underneath as well. So it is quite consistent, it will come in and it will come out in a, in a, in a pretty regular manner. Yeah, it's like a set of lungs isn't it? In and yeah, out, the in and breathing. out. The ocean is breathing. Yeah. <laughs> um, from what we've seen fr from the pictures of that surge in Tutukaka, it looks at this stage like there hasn't been any damage to the vessels that are moored there at the moment. Is that what you're seeing? Yes, yes it is. The, the, the risk really is sustained current and that strength of current against some of the um, the mooring poles there, the piles, mm. um, but they are they have just done a revamp in the marina, so with any luck they will be, they have done a good job and they'll hold their hold their course. Um, the, other, the other risk really is around trade ropes that are continually against a little bit of a strain that they're not normally under, but the marina management have got all of that under control. Fantastic. Hey, thank you so much once again for giving us your time. Kia ho, oh, maru, stay welcome. safe. We'll catch you thank soon. You. That is Kate Malcolm from Dive Tutukaka.
Oh, this is a little bit unusual. Our reporter Kristen Hall is currently on the inter island of Ferry in the Cook Strait. She's heading to Picton. Uh, she's with us now on the phone. Uh, Kristen, how are things going there? Kia ora, Melissa. I'm, I'm just on the Blue Bridge Ferry, just a small correction, but we both have been stuck out here uh, just outside of Picton uh, for a little while now. Um, us on the Blue Bridge Ferry, we've been uh, circling this small island about 9 k's out of Picton um, for about an hour and a half now. We did get a notification a little while ago that the Harbour Master had closed the port, um, but just about two minutes ago, um, we've heard that it has opened again and a bit of a cheer went out uh, around the ship as um, some people were pretty nervous about having to spend all day on the ferry. Gosh, I bet. What are sea conditions like? Um, it's actually been really calm. We haven't seen any surges whatsoever, which I think is what helps keep uh, people pretty chilled out. People were mostly uh, just worried about uh, missing deadlines for the truckies, for example, and having a bit of a delay to their holiday. But it's a gorgeous day out here, and we've just had a lovely view going round and around this island. <laughs> and what did you get told on board? When did you leave Wellington? Uh, we left Wellington at 8 o'clock this morning, so yeah, it has been a, a bit of a long ride for us. And yeah, we did get an update kind of late morning saying that obviously this tsunami um, was going to affect us and that they were going to just keep updating us. So we did get quite a few regular updates, um, which was good. The Marlborough Civil Defence had put out a warning, I think, that um, they were expecting uh, surges of about a metre. So I think it was just a precautionary thing. And how many of you are, are on the ferry? Oh, I'm not sure. There's, there's definitely a few hundred uh, mix of kind of holiday makers and truckies and things like that. Uh, definitely there was a bit of a queue that started forming uh, when we heard <laughs> when we weren't uh, when we heard that they weren't sure when we were going to be able to dock. But everyone is looking pretty relaxed now and ready to get in Picton. It must be a little bit of a surreal situation to find yourself in, Kristen. Yeah, it is a little bit. I was just on my day off. Uh, looking forward to a nice uh, trip to Picton and had a little bit of a delay, but it sounds like uh, things are a lot worse up north and a lot more nerve-wracking for people up there, so just happy to be able to get in there and that we haven't been too affected down here. Obviously, the crossing can usually be pretty treacherous with the waves and the wind, but it hasn't been the case this time. And how are staff treating you? Are you getting a free lemonade or anything? Oh, uh, there has been free uh, tea and coffee, yes, uh, for the people that have been waiting for a while. Staff have been lovely, everyone seeming nice and relaxed. So, yeah, we are all good here on the ferry. <laughs> Ten all by Kristen Hall, uh, circling an island outside of Picton's. <laughs> and enjoying her day off. Auckland's ferry services have been suspended, just so you know, until at least 2 o'clock this afternoon. Uh, that is because, of course, a warning is in place for the coastal regions around Auckland. You don't have to evacuate if you're in the Auckland region, but you are advised to stay away from the water. Tra uh, Britomart train station has also been closed due to the possibility of flooding. Until 3 p.m., trains on the Eastern Line will run as far as Panmuir with services to the West, South and Onihunga ending at Newmarket. Emily Lane is a tsunami scientist with NIWA and joins us now from Ōtautahi Christchurch. Kia ora, Emily. Well, what an extraordinary day it has been. Thank you so much for being with us to share your expertise. Can you just begin by giving us your assessment as to the likelihood we will see significant waves or surges this afternoon? Kia ora. Um, I think what we're going to see is a continuation of what we've seen so far. Um, it's unlikely to get any bigger than what we've seen so far. There's a very small chance of that, but it's unlikely. So it's probably just going to keep on keeping on for um, a few more hours yet and, and slowly sort of peter off. Um, when do you think then that the risk will be lifted? Um, I'm it, I'm thinking that the the sort of the the marine and um, and sea threat is probably going to continue on for um, at, at least another sort of three or four hours. This is everyone always asks the tsunami scientists when is it safe, and it, it's a really hard thing to to answer because 
it, it slowly, you know, you sort of, um, the woman from Tutukaka was talking about these surges and coming yeah. in and out, and, and that's what you see. And, I mean, she was talking about sort of four to six minutes, and in, in many places there has been that. We've also sort of seen um, sort of more slower ones that have happened over about a half an hour to three quarters of an hour. And sometimes you get the, the two of them, so you'll sort of have it going up and down sort of over that same sort of period and they will slowly get smaller but it might be that the waves go down a bit and then they come up a bit again and so this is why we we have to be cautious and we ask people to be patient. And Emily from the information you're getting at the moment what regions have been most affected by surges or waves so far? Um, it sounds like um, Great Barrier, um, sort of north, you know, that sort of the east coast mm -hmm. of Northland. Um, I saw a picture from Tokomaru Bay, um, sort of near Gisborne, um, of you know the the surge coming in, um, which again was sort of quite impressive. So I mean, I think it's that that sort of east coast of the um, the North Island, which was the place. The places that we were expecting. Yeah, can you talk us through your expectations? Uh, after a seismic event of this size and nature, centred at the Kermadex about a thousand kilometres from New Zealand, what under normal circumstances would you expect to see? Um, I mean, th th this is pretty much it. I mean, you know, what, what happens is that, you know, a large part of the seafloor um, around the Kermadex got lifted up, you know, sort of, uh, you know, 100 kilometres by 50 kilometres or sort of more and so that lifts the water up above it and for a tsunami the whole pacific ocean is like a paddly pool so you know you can imagine you know you throw a rock into a paddly pool and you see waves when you look at simulations of what happens with tsunami waves it looks like that and so they radiate away from the kermadex um, and they get um, refracted around so um, the the speed of the wave is dependent on the the depth of the water and it actually causes them to bend around and come back towards New Zealand because normally they'd sort of, you know, you get the, the tsunami, the earthquake happens here and they most of them push out like that. Mm. But these bits, parts of the wave, some of that energy refracts around and sort of hits New Zealand. And so that's what we're seeing um, is these waves that have sort of curved around and come back to the coast. We're almost exactly an hour now since a 6.2 magnitude earthquake was recorded similar place near the Kermadec Islands. Is that likely to cause more coastal surges? Um, it's unlikely to, to it, no, it's, it's unlikely to do anything that we're going to notice because given mm. that we're already having these waves um, and a, a 6.5 is considerably smaller than uh, an 8, it's sort of a logarithmic scale. So a 6 is actually 100 times smaller than an, an 8 in terms of the size. And so, yeah, that's, that's just going to be lost in the noise. And is there a direct relationship between the size of an earthquake and the size of a tsunami or surge? Um, it, th th there's a strong relationship. It's not, it's not completely direct. And, I mean, this is one of the reasons why we are more cautious. Uh, you know, we, we are more likely to say, you know, these areas, you know, might need to evacuate and it might turn out that there isn't a big wave because we know big picture how big it is, mm. but the details of exactly how that, that um, seafloor moves can be really important in terms of where you actually get the big waves. Right. And so as tsunami scientists, we need to like look at well what, what different things might have occurred that caused this and what might that mean in terms of what you see on the land. Right. And so yeah, we sort of look at these and we look at all of the the sort of the worst case that it could cause and yeah, we, we've got to take all of those and say, well, any of these might happen because we don't have enough information yet to say this is the one that it is. Emily, I know some of your colleagues around the world refer to data that is recorded by remote uh, tsunami assessors. So you have uh, essentially boys sitting out in the middle of the ocean that are able to record ocean currents and movements. How do you get your information when it comes to tidal movements around New Zealand? 
Yep. So, so um, it sounds like what you're referring to is what we call dart boys. Um, and so, yeah, so what they do is they actually measure the, the pressure um, or at the bottom of the ocean because the pressure is directly related to the, the height of the wave. Mm. And so the, the problem is you need information about, you know, as I said, we know a tsunami is coming. We don't know how big it is. Um, and a lot of this is happening in the, the middle of the Pacific Ocean. So we've got these dart boys there and we can look at how big the tsunami is when it comes over them. And the interesting thing is in the deep ocean, a tsunami might be quite small. It only might be 10 or 20 centimetres. Um, but the thing is it's 10 or 20 centimetres over 100 kilometres. And then as you get towards the shore, you can imagine you've got 10 centimetres over 100 kilometres, but it gets squeezed up. And so suddenly that, that height goes up and we call yeah. that shoaling. Right. So, yeah, that, that's why, you know, but, but yeah, you, we use those dart boys. So that is one of the information um, that we get. Also, um, tsunami gauges um, on the coast. Okay, so, so can you just talk, talk me through how that works? And excuse my naivety, sorry, Emily. Do, do you have buoys that are located? Because we know the Kermadec Trench is an area where we have experienced um, seismic activity in the past. Do you have buoys located between the Kermadec Trench and the New Zealand mainland? Or are you basically using your models to try and work out exactly how tsunamis or storm surges will affect the mainland and then comparing that with your data as the, those surges uh, reach the New Zealand shore? Yep, so, so we're actually um, really lucky in that um, just sort of in the last um, year or so, New Zealand has um, put out its own set of tsunami. So we've got a lot more information. You know, we used to rely on some American ones and then basically they, um, I mean, you know, it, it's in the middle of the ocean, they broke down and no one was going to replace them. Um, so we, we um, got money through the New Zealand government and so um, the um, NEMA put out buoys out there and they've only been out there for, um, you know, a year at most. Um, but that, So that's extra information that we've got. And so what we do is... We have models based on the earthquake right. and we run them. As we start getting information at those dart boys, we compare the informa you know, what our model says or, or our, our suite of models, because as I said, we're looking at sort of different scenarios. We compare them with the dart boys and we try and sort of look at, well, which of those um, scenarios fits best with what we're actually seeing really happening. And the same with, you know, we have these um, coastal um, tsunami gauges, so North mm. Cape, East Cape, um, and a range of places. And so as we get information in there, we can compare the models with those. And then sometimes as a next step, we actually tweak those models to try and make them look more, you know, to, to try and sort of fit mm -hmm what we're seeing is actually happening in reality. So that's why it's an evolving situation. And, you know, we, we might sort of change those threat levels based on what we're seeing from that. Yeah, it's a, it's a complex process, isn't it, Emily? But, um, I, I, you know, thank you so much for being with us. I know you're going to try and stick around this afternoon. I, I think we uh, would all really appreciate if you're able to and we can benefit from your expertise. Just to go over a couple of really key points there that Emily made. From the information she and her colleagues have at the moment uh, they don't expect the storm uh, the surges or the waves to be any worse than what some parts of coastal New Zealand are already expecting however they are likely to continue for some time so they're unlikely to get any bigger but they are likely to continue for some time which means we're going to have to wait until we can lift those official alert levels so everything seems like it's tracking quite well at the, the moment and the other thing that looks like is tracking pretty well is that there has just been the announcement of COVID cases today. Uh, there are no new cases of COVID-19 in the community. We are also just looking at some pictures of the moment of a live chopper shot over Auckland, taking a look at the water there. It all still looks pretty still as far as I can tell. I'm no marine expert, uh, but things uh, look pretty nice out there and pretty still. Remember, if you are watching and you are in Auckland, please, the advice is to stay away from all coastal areas. Uh, don't forget, we are still also waiting for a decision on alert levels that affects Auckland and the rest of the country. Auckland currently at alert level three. We should hear about that at four o'clock, uh, but anything could happen.
today. Uh, yeah. So as I say, these are live uh, pictures just going down. This is heading, heading north from here. Albany, I believe. So the helicopter's just taken off from Albany. It's going to be heading north. I don't think you will ever see uh, any part of the Hauraki Gulf or the waters around Auckland uh, as quiet as they are right now. But of course, uh, most boaties clearly taking the advice of the authorities uh, in the Auckland region at the moment being advised to stay off the water, stay away from the water. There is no need to evacuate from the information we have available at this stage. But at the very least, we have some gorgeous pictures for you as our helicopter brings us these live pictures. We're going to continue to keep you up to date with the very latest on how the tsunami warnings and surges are affecting parts of coastal New Zealand throughout the afternoon. And that includes going to Sean Hogan, who's up on Hospital Hill in Napier. Uh, kia ora, Sean. How are you going? Have you got some of the lads there? Yeah, I've got some of the boys from the port down here. I've got Aaron and TK. So those guys have had... Um, uh, evacuated up here because they're in one of the tsunami uh, red zones which are around Hawke's Bay who if you are in one of them in Hawke's Bay it's being advised that you do evacuate and get to higher ground. Uh, so the whole port has been um, shut, uh, shut down for now and um, I must correct you Melissa and this is my fault but we are up on Bluff Hill. I had a, had a reader write in to say that I got it wrong with the hospital hill so I'll fully acknowledge that but we've got Aaron and uh, TK here who have very kindly decided to speak to me on air. Aaron was very keen to be on air weren't oh, you? Just come to say hello next time we're on TV. Yeah, so, um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, good, Ex good, good one, Sean. So yeah. we'll talk about, talk about the quake this morning. Yeah, it was happening around 2.30 this morning. You yeah, felt it, did 2 you? 2.30 this morning, yeah. The, one of the biggest quakes I've felt, so, yes, around here. So a uh, bit of a shock to the system at 2.30 in the morning. But, uh, yeah, just, yeah, rolled out with it and that was it. Um, came to work this morning. Now uh, everyone was just, yeah, just in the same sort of state of mind, just mm -hmm. a bit shocked from it, so... Um, yeah, now we're up here, um, the port's evacuated, so, as yep. you were just saying. So. Yeah. So what did you do during the quake? What did you, what did you do? Did you, did you think you needed to evacuate or anything? Nah, not, not from where I was, just, it, it did wake me up, but I didn't go running away anywhere, mm. so, mm. um, it was a bit of a shock. Mm. So, um, wasn't too bad, but enough to wake you up. Yeah, and yeah. TK, you felt it as well where you were, you, you, you love, lovely pronounce the way that you, you say your town, could you, could you describe it for me? Yeah, the metropolis of Wauhiki, uh, <laughs> you definitely woke up to the, uh, to the earthquake, and uh, yeah, I just went in by the kids to make sure they were alright, and then after that we're, we're pretty safe in Wauhiki, mm. so I was able to go back to bed. Mm -hmm. Awesome, <laughs> that's lovely, that's nice for you, <laughs> isn't it? Um, so you guys came down to the port this morning, it was all, all clear at that stage, what, what, what played out from there, Aaron? So we got together, had our, had our daily morning meeting, and obviously the earthquake was, was the topic this morning, just to be aware of how our, like, our work area might have changed mm -hmm. since, since the earthquake, so... Um, once checking that over, we proceeded with works, but then uh, later in the morning there was an earthquake up in the Kermadex, so um, things changed and uh, the tsunami warning went out, so the port closed down and um, all the staff that are on the port are up here now. So It's a bit of a trick up here, how'd you guys get up here? Yeah, we all uh, walked. <laughs> <laughs> so, so a bit of a walk for 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 some people, but um, we're all up here, and so we're all we're all safe. And yeah, yeah. What's the waiting been like, TK? Has it been okay? Uh, yeah, it's been pretty good actually. The pizza's just turned up, so I'm pretty keen to get stuck into that. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, like Aaron was saying, it was a bit of a walk up the hill, and the the port has its own kind of uh, uh, emergency system, so the sirens went off, and uh, everyone got told to evacuate. So. Bit of a bit of a walk up the hill. There was a few stops along the way, and then, uh, <laughs> but now nah, we're we're pretty safe. Cool, awesome guys. Well, as they just said, the pizza has arrived for the staff members, so um, they're going to get tucking into that. I'm told if I wear high vis, I might be able to sneak a slice myself. So uh, we'll throw it back to you guys. And you probably can have a, a slice of pizza uh. to uh, celebrate, Sean, because we have just been told while you're interviewing uh, those two that the tsunami alert has been lifted. Uh, you can start making your way home if you have gone to high ground or headed inland now is the time you can start to go home but do also still stay away from coastal areas we could still see some of that unusual activity the storm the surges of sea coming in uh, so do take care around there but overall uh, the country the alert levels have been lifted yeah i'll just i'll read you the the line here from the national emergency management agency 
This is current and it replaces um, all of the previous warnings that were in place and it affects the whole country. GNS Science has advised the largest waves have now passed. The threat level has been downgraded to a beach and marine threat for all areas that were previously under land and marine threats. That means if you've evacuated to higher ground, you can now return home. All people who evacuated can return. However, as Melissa just said, stay away from water and beach areas uh, until we have any more updates from the officials. So Graham Leonard is with us. He's a GNS senior scientist. Graham, what a morning so far. Uh, you must be feeling it. Yeah. What is the latest information? Right, well, you just, you just mentioned it. The Civil Defence Emergency Management have updated their advisory. So we, we still have a, uh, a widespread advisory in effect for strong and unusual currents in the water. So that's, that's, I guess that's their key message. From a physical science point of view, just recapping, we've had the three largest quakes starting at 2.27 this morning off East Cape. We had a magnitude 7.1. Uh, strongly felt shaking and uh, tsunami arrivals from that uh, relatively small. And then at 6.41 and more importantly at 8.28 a.m. with a magnitude 8.1 up in the Kerbenex, uh, we had a, a shallow earthquake and a generation of a tsunami and that's what's caused the uh, tsunami advisory over the morning up until now. All right, Graham, this is uh, your area of expertise, developing effective response to warning systems, especially for a tsunami. How did we do today? Well, we've certainly seen uh, an evolution of uh, systems over the last decade. And I'm really pleased to see uh, our uh, geohazard analysts and the National Geohazard Monitoring Center uh, monitoring that seismic data and analyzing the tsunami rapidly. They saw that data as it was coming in in each of those earthquakes and we're working on the tsunami models uh, to provide to emergency management. Uh, and we also have, as a country, uh, have implemented emergency mobile alerts, EMA, uh, in the last couple of years and you saw those EMAs uh, coming out uh, to advise people of that evacuation message from civil defence. Uh, more recently we've seen that in use for COVID but it is particularly well um, set up for tsunami because of that rapid ability to reach large swaths of people in affected areas. To those people uh, like we've heard locals up uh, north in Mangafai uh, going out surfing, what's your advice to people that maybe didn't heed the warnings today? Tsunami are dangerous. We're not talking about shallow wind waves. These are deep whole of water column waves and they can be very long uh, minutes or tens of minutes long with a, a surging or a withdrawal of the wave. They're often in training debris or sediment. So they're very dangerous to be in. This is not like being in an ocean wave. And it's a, it's a very dangerous thing to be in even if it's uh, not notably affecting on, on land beyond the beach. Uh, people need to be watching for currents and staying out of the water and heeding those advisories for sure. The other key point here is, uh, you know, with big events like this, we do often see aftershocks, notable aftershocks. So people need to stay well tuned to civil defence in case of any further alerts, especially tsunami alerts. I know that uh, you'll be all taking some time now to look at the data and things that came through. Are there any lessons to be learnt so far? Uh, we're always learning from new events. Big events like this uh, don't happen every year or even every decade. You know, in the last decade or two, this is quite a unique situation up in that area. So we will learn a vast amount from this. We're already processing that data, understanding this quake, how it relates to the plate boundary, the, the, the major fault that it comes from. Uh, this is going to be a, a, a really um, very useful learning event and our scientists will be, uh, will, will be gathering information from it for a long time to come. Uh, Graham Leonard, GNS Senior Scientist, thank you very much. And um, what a relief that this is a learning event. Yeah, a useful learning event. That's an understatement. If ever we heard one, just bringing you up to date with the very latest. The evacuation uh, advice for all of New Zealand has been lifted in the last half an hour. GNS scientists say concerns over a tsunami or tidal surge uh, have been lifted. However, if you are in a coastal region, you're advised to stay away from the water until we have further advice. That's it, though, from us and the whole One News team. I think. We have all earned a weekend. Until then, kia ho maru, stay safe, and well done to those of you who had to evacuate doing the right thing this morning following official There'll be a press conference at 4pm when the Prime Minister is expected to announce any changes to the COVID-19 alert levels. Until then, you can head to onenews.co.nz. From us, ka we'll see you soon.